Hello everyone, uh, welcome to today's workshop, um, Simplicity and Design. Going to cover a bunch of different stuff, might be jam-packed in the hour, so we're going to jump right into it. And I'm here with Andrew W. today from 2073 as our moderator. Oh, I'm trying to click on the wrong window. There we go. A little bit about me, um, I've been doing FIRST forever, actually slightly longer than, than Andrew here has been alive. Uh, most of that time was spent as the lead mentor of 973 for 12 years. Uh, we were pretty successful in that time. Um, about two years ago, moved up to the, the Bay Area in California, worked with 2D4 for a season, and then, you know, no one's really competing right now, but I'm splitting my time with 2135 and 2D4. Um, and my family moved up here for me to be a mechanical engineering manager at what was formerly Ori's Health, which has a just crazy number of high-level first alumni. Um, you can see my daughter here, my dog's here, just a little bit about me. Keep clicking on the wrong spot. There we go. So... What we're trying to do today is there's a bunch of existing presentations that really hammer in the benefit simplicity, but don't talk too much about how you quantify it or how you get there or what's really behind that. So hopefully this will give you some tools to operate with going forward. So since this is based on other presentations, absolutely got to point those out. Um, the two that are just the absolute holy grail, uh, Karthik on 1114, their former lead mentor has run this strategic design workshop for many years. It's really dialed in now. Um, it's also fun to watch them sequentially over the years because the stories and anecdotes change with that time. Mike Rossetto has got a similar but different one. Um, Mike being an ME makes it a little more focused on design, but still very similar topics. Absolutely got to watch both. They're incredible. Um, I'd recommend you go past that. Mike's got a really good one on goal setting, which doesn't sound exactly like, you know, design or simplicity or that sort of thing, but it's incredibly pertinent. Got to watch it. Um, Karthik, or maybe 1114, I forget who runs this one, is a pretty good one on scouting the mat strategy. And then the presentation we're doing today is a subset of like a two-hour presentation I did with 971 about two months ago. Um, it has some other peripheral topics. So when these slides eventually get posted, I recommend taking a peek at that longer one. So before we get into um, what I'm presenting later on, I kind of want to steal some content from these guys. You know, if you're going to take one thing from Karthik's presentation, it's if your team has 30 or whatever number arbitrary points of resources, you want to spend that on things that will be 100%. You don't want to spend that spread across things that will be less performant. Um, and, and resource points are, you know, could be anything. Could be funds, could be machines, could be student talent, mentor talent, parent talent, any of that kind of stuff. And it's not going to be the same for every team. And you know, the unique cost function for every team is going to be a little different. But that rough point there of, you know, make sure you're spending all your points on things that are going to perform at a 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10, versus doing more things that will perform at a lower level. Um, one of the benefits of simplicity I really like um, is just you have less options. And that, that sounds bad, but it, once you've locked in, on something that's simpler, the fact that there's less decisions you have to make going forward is incredibly beneficial. It's really hard to make good decisions quickly in stressful situations. Um, and those benefits are, you know, at home, at event, in match, so on. At home, I really like that once you've decided to do less stuff, you can really focus on the remainder that much more. I forget exactly which workshop I stole this uh, from Mike Corsetto in, but you know, he's got a line of like, you should be celebrating every time your team decides to axe a feature or to not do something because then you have that much less work to do. Um, as you get more into the strategy, I really like pre-match when you have a robot that can do less. Do enough, but do less because you just have less options and it makes it easier to plan. Like you don't have all these different contingencies you could do or like secret features or different end game or that sort of thing. Um, you know, you'll see games like maybe 2013 where kind of everyone was in the same boat where most robots were just doing pure cycling it makes pre-match planning a lot easier. Um, and then in the pit of the events, it's real nice too, because, you know, it can be really stressful if you have a fairly complicated robot. Um, you have that many more features to keep tuned in, that many more things to, you know, run your pre-match and post-match checks on. Some of those features might not be done and ready. So you're kind of balancing going to the practice field and tuning those features in. And, and that sort of thing. And if you just have less, it's you know, less to focus on. And I, I just, until you've done it, it's really hard to appreciate what, you know, going to an event and not having all those things to work on really feels like having a robot that just works the whole time. Um, another point that's tangential, but really important here is, you know, there's kind of two numbers you can use to quantify the effectiveness of your robot. One is like, what is the peak 
that that architecture could perform at. So if you abstract your robot out to like a picture on a whiteboard with, you know, what the joints are, what the features are, that sort of thing, most robots in first are actually really incredible and can do a whole lot. Um, the second number though is what did you actually accomplish with that feature set? Now, optimally, those two numbers should be the same. You draw a robot on the whiteboard that can compete, you know, at 150 units of goodness and you compete at 150. In reality, most teams have a robot on the whiteboard that could, you know, do 200 points of, of goodness or whatever unit we want to use and they compete at like 50 or 100. And when you overreach like that, sorry, when you overreach like that, um, nothing works that well. And, you know, that's kind of coming back to that, that Karthik golden rule above because you're stretched too thin. You don't have time to implement all your features nicely. Nothing's really optimized. You know, you, you spread your weight across too many systems. So maybe some aren't as robust. You spread your programming talent, so on and so on. Um, it, it's also much easier to take a robot. Let's say your, your team could afford to make a robot with 150 units of competitiveness and you made one with 120. So you, you got it done real quick and you got 30 units left, it's way easier to take those 30 excess units and add more to your robot and tweak it and that sort of thing than it is to try to play from behind and take a robot that, you know, you try to spend 200 units, you only have 150. It's really hard to recover from that in season. Kind of related to this, um, and this is something 973 used to do back in the day, and I've, I've seen this trap with other teams. You don't want to make a robot that... Uh, What's better way to say that? You don't want to take one of those robots where you're deficient in points. You know, so you aimed for making this really complicated robot. You got it halfway done. You finish it in the off season. You go to your off season events, and at, you know the last matches you remember from that robot are at the off season when you finally got it tuned in really well. Um, and then you you bring that message into kickoff of like, oh yeah, all those really complicated decisions we made last year, they totally worked out. That robot was killer. Um, that's a dangerous lesson because you really want to peak, you know, either at regionals or champs, depending on what your team's goals are. In peaking in the off season, unless it's your team's charter to be less performant in the season and just kill it at off seasons, I mean, it's, that's just not a great goal. So careful of uh, justifying the previous year's decisions based on data that was too late. You know, try to ground yourself closer to kickoff and go back and watch matches from your first regional, your second regional from champs. Um, look at the performance there versus you know potentially higher off season performance. Um, opportunity cost is a, is a theme I'm really big on. I mean, the short of it is anything you're doing is something else that you can't do. Um, so just because your team spent resources and accomplished something that was measurably effective does not necessarily mean that that was the right decision to make. Um, and, and it doesn't mean it was the wrong decision. It's just something to be cognizant of and think about. You should be constantly assessing, you know, both in season and after the season, are we really spending our limited resources in the way that benefit our performance the most? Um, I like to break things down when talking with students. of like, imagine we're going to spend an hour on XYZ. Like, how much is that going to boost our average points per match? You know, we never actually math it out, but it's just something to kind of drive the point home of like the time you're spending should be going to increasing performance, assuming that's your goals. And you should try to get the biggest increase in performance you can for the time you're spending. I think a great example of this is a lot of teams will, as they're shifting to being more competitive, feel that they have to make a custom drivetrain and they'll tie up their top students on the design side. They'll tie up their fabrication resources early in season. They'll get it done. They'll, you know, the drivetrain will be done week three or four. It'll totally work. It might be a little better than a kid apart drive. Uh, won't be substantially better. And you know, the, their memory from that season is, man, we bit off a custom drivetrain and it worked and it did really well. And that was a great decision. But in reality, for most teams, those design and fabrication resources early in season are probably far better spent on better prototypes or earlier production of the rest of the robot. So I got a picture, I think it's a 1720 here. They got this beautiful looking kit apart drive. I think it's got six Neos on it, uh, so plenty of power. This is gonna be competitive with, with any team out there really. And unless you want to start getting to the swerve silliness. Um, and you can just buy two of these and configure them how you want and put them together. And you can have them drive in really quickly in season. You cannot, most teams cannot fabricate a drivetrain, have it wired, driving and programming faster than you could with a kit apart drive. You'll see some really high level teams do it. And it makes sense for them because they have so many excess resources and they can move so quack, quickly that the opportunity cost isn't that bad. But for most teams, I'd really stress, even if you've been nailing your custom drivetrain year after year, really consider, would I be better if I spent those resources on something else? All right, I think 
this might be the last slide before we start jumping into the simplicity stuff. Um, another theme that that you know I, I took a while to learn at first, and now that I've I've got it, it's kind of like my cult that I really buy into, and that's you you don't want to approach this as like you know I, I do all the stuff in Carthix workshops and I make my robot shall list, um, and then the season just kind of happens how it happens. We're going to design all this stuff and we're going to be done when we're done. And whether or not people realize that's what they're doing, I think the bulk of teams work that way. You know, they say they're going to work faster. They have a Gantt chart saying when the robot's going to be done and that sort of thing. But what they're not doing is along the way through the course of build season, they're not adjusting their decisions to meet the schedule other than at a certain point they have to compete. So what I would like to hammer home is you buy into a schedule as a team with clear dates that you agree you will not miss. And maybe you miss them a little bit, but you really drive towards those. And if it looks like you're at risk of missing those, that means you bid off too much and you should de-scope to, to go back to hitting those schedules. Um, ideally, you de-scope earlier and not later. It's certainly more expensive to de-scope later than earlier. Um, but I, I wouldn't focus on the sunk cost of we've got three, four weeks in the build season. We're three, four weeks from done, but we can't change it because we already spent three or four weeks on this concept. No, I would go simpler. In 2019 on 973, on kickoff day, I was really wanting to skip the high goal entirely. And I, when we just couldn't do it as a team. We just had to go high because that's what good teams are doing. And we waited till I think about week five or six of build season to fully remove that stage of our elevator to make our robot only able to score in low and middle um, to kind of remove options for what we could do on the field, save some weight. Um, make practice a little easier because we were only had, had to play one match plan. You know, limbs and quals kind of ended up the same at that point. Um, but earlier is better, obviously. Now, it might sound crazy up here if you're a team that's not used to doing this, of like drivetrain done and running day nine, and then comp up done day 29. But if you embrace it as your culture and learn to figure out what your resources are and learn how quickly you can work with those, these are totally achievable goals. Most high-level competitive teams are hitting these with incredibly ambitious designs. You can absolutely hit it with simpler stuff. And then you might ask, you know, especially with no bag, you know, day 29 is very early compared to our events. Why have that so early? It's so you can spend all your time here. You want to get that robot done as soon as you can so you can go to the practice field, tune shots, practice scoring, whatever is relevant for the game, get your autonomous going, and get all of that kind of stuff. And what you'll find is even though the robot was done on day 29, there's all sorts of optimizations and tweaks that'll fall out of uh, you know, a rigorous practice schedule. All right, so we get into the next section. It's a little messy, um, but what we're trying to do here is no one ever disagrees on you should go simpler, and there are benefits of it. But simplicity means like a million different things in first. Um, you could be simpler in terms of design. You could be simpler in terms of how you're making stuff, how you program stuff, whatever. Um, so I'm just going over a bunch of different ways you could be simpler. None of these are spots where if you are more complicated, it's, it's like a death sentence. And if you're less complicated, you're guaranteed to be good. These are all just themes. Um, and you'll probably see your team more in some of these than others. Um, but it's important just to see all the different ways you could be simpler and then kind of compare that to your team's resources and prior experiences and figure out which one of these you can afford to be more complex and capable in and which ones you should really pare down on. So let's jump into it. So high level, and I got to work on this presentation for another year or two to get this more cohesive, but high level, um, you know, how integrated is your robot? We'll talk about uh, is your robot kind of a collection of separate parts or is it like really one thing where everything has to tightly integrate and work well together? A lot of short robots in 2020 for the short season um, were very highly integrated. Some of the tall robots were less integrated. How much do you have to invent? You know, is your robot entirely made of existing FRC systems that you've you know, can pull up video of and see in the past? Or does it require you to invent something new to first? Maybe not new in the world, but at least new to first, and you haven't seen teams do it successfully. Uh, tactical features are, you know, things that optimize your match and make it kind of go quicker, and we'll see that more. Uh, I should spell that out as degrees of freedom, but you know, just how many joints on your robot? How many things can it do? Um, and then we'll get into a little bit of different types of mechanisms, what are simpler, what are harder. Um, Tuning is a big one. You know, how do you take your box of parts, put the robot together, put code on it, adjust the robot and compete? There's a lot to that last part that people overlook. They're, you know, they're usually more focused on the design. And then we'll touch on a little bit of, you know, how you should be using COTS to move faster. Um, so this first one, I, I think is probably the, 
uh, I don't know, they're all the most important one to, to highlight. I, I feel this is one of the most important ones when you're starting to get into more complicated robots is determining, are you the ty type of team that has the firepower to design a robot that requires really tight integration where you need all your systems uh, to kind of be designed and work at the same time. Because if you get halfway through designing your robot and find that you actually can't make a shooter work in a really tight package, you have to toss the whole thing out. Um, if you can do that, there's some benefits to how simple the robot is once it's done, but the process of getting there can be rough and really isn't that simple. So if you look up here, 1678, 2016, I recommend you pull up and watch some video of them later. Um, super tightly integrated. Like you could not take a single part of this robot off and, and like clue it into some other robot. You know, everything in here required everything else for it to work perfectly. And they could do it. They could design it. And this robot was great at regionals. It was great at champs. It worked the whole season. They pulled it off. Um, if we come down here and look at 1241, and they've got some great videos you can see of their prototyping. That's why I really like this robot here as a case study. Um, their intake and bridge mechanism is entirely separate from the conveyor that it feeds into. Like you could totally replace that intake with a different intake, wouldn't affect the conveyor. The conveyor that feeds balls up to the top, kind of same thing. That conveyor could have existed in any number of forms. The shooter itself, same thing. You could replace that shooter at any point in season with any number of shooters. Um, and it would be easy to do so. And the benefits there, I think, are less about your ability to replace during season, which is a nice benefit, knowing that you could tweak things down the road, and more about if your team has less FRC experience, less design skills, it's far easier to get a robot working if you can kind of make those things separable and attack them, attack them piecemeal and know, hey, as long as my intake can bring a ball in through this hole, then my intake's good. It can be whatever form we need. As long as my conveyor can take a ball from here to here, then the conveyor is going to work and so on and so on. Um, some years this is, you know, you kind of get it super easily. Like a lot of 2019 robots were just an elevator with a claw on it. That's pretty separable. You start looking at maybe like 1678 in 2019. Um, yeah, it was technically still an elevator with a claw on it, but it like swung through the elevator and, you know, that was really tightly integrated and complicated. So uh, it's definitely something to be aware of. We'll jump to the next one now. Tactical features, I think, are something that really started getting cool and first around the start of the decade, which, you know, is really starting to seem a while ago. Um, and what I mean by tactical features are they're not actually changing what parts of the game you're playing. So, like, you're going to have your first uh, initial feature set coming from strategy of, like, we will shoot high goals. We'll be able to pick up things from the ground. We'll be able to climb, that sort of thing. But you're not really talking about how you're going to do them. Tactical features are kind of modifiers on that that increase that capability or like save some time in the match. Um, 2016 is a game I really like referencing for tactical features because there were so many little ones you could sprinkle in. Like you could make your shooter completely unblockable so that if a robot was parked in front of you, they couldn't block your shots. Um, it was pretty common to have your intake on the opposite side of the direction you shot. So you, you know, drive backwards to pick up a ball, drive forwards to shoot it. Um, uh, what other ones? Uh, you know, for 2016, there was like a bridge you could lower. Was that something that you drove up and then lowered an arm and then drove over? Or did you have like a purely passive mechanism that let you just keep driving and go all over it? Um, 2019, did you have an active system like 1678 did with two wings that came down to faci facilitate buddy climbing? Or did you just, you know, climb yourself and have other robots go up? So I'm not necessarily saying skip tactical features, but I think unless you are you know, routinely a top 25 team, they're one of the easier spots to skip um, to make your robot feature list simpler um, and, and save you a lot of time. My number one team, and the reason they're on this slide so much to reference for these sort of things is 2056. Um, year in and year out, they generally skip a lot of these tactical features that I think if you pulled the top 100 teams in first any given year, they would say you need these three tactical features to be competitive this year. You need your intake opposite your shooter. You need to be able to swing over the back for auto, that sort of thing. They usually skip that stuff and then they're incredibly good. So unless you're at the really highest level, I would consider maybe not shoving in every tactical feature you can. You get some for free, sure, with how you're laying your robot out, but cool. Degrees of freedom is probably the first one people think about when they're talking about simplicity. And that's just, what is the total amount of actuation and motion you have on your robot? And as a rough sort, sure, it's a good metric. You know, you might have a robot that has 17 things that can move between the motors, the pneumatics, et cetera. And you might have a robot with eight things that can move. 
On average, the one with 17 things that can move is probably more complicated, but that's not universally true. You know, the, these different degrees of freedom have different costs. You know, a pneumatic cylinder that just goes back and forth to move a latch and isn't dependent on the rest of the robot at all, that, you know, that's almost a freed off. It, it's, it's really inexpensive compared to other ones. Um, a servo doff, so that's where you have a motor, you have a sensor, you have software that is referencing that sensor and controlling the position of the motor to arbitrary and unique angles. That's, that's going to be more expensive than a pneumatic cylinder where you can just tell it to go out or come back in. Um, it's not prohibitively expensive for a lot of teams, especially with the, you know, both the rev and the across the road ecosystem now having pretty good servo options, but a servo DOF is, is going to be more expensive. Um, as you start linking DOFs together is then another level where you can get significant increases in complexity. So if you have a robot where I need my intake to be down and then, oh, this isn't mirrored, so I'm confusing myself. If I need my intake to be down and I need some other system in this position and I need to hand the ball off and then this one comes up and then I have some complicated sequence where I do this and then that and then this before I, I finish shooting, that's a lot harder because now you can't just tell each system to go to its spot and trust that it's going to get there. You need to make sure that every part of that handoff or sequencing happens, um, like actually happens, you know, verify it with a sensor or you need to wait for it to finish, you know, just give it excessive amounts of time. Um, and that, that's harder. You'll see a lot of robots with handoffs kind of juggle balls or juggle game pieces because they didn't nail this. Um, and nothing simpler than like the ball goes into the claw and then it comes out easy. Coordinated motion is kind of similar to, to sequencing. I think it's actually a little easier than sequencing these days, but still, um, and that's, do I need to move multiple servo joints together to achieve the motion I'm trying to do? So on this 284 robot here, we have a, a linear elevator that goes up down. And then we actually had the ability to do horizontal motion in a pris pris uh, prismatic sense, but it wasn't achieved with a single linear degree of freedom. It was actually two rotary joints. And if you control the angle of both rotary joints and the elevator properly, you know, the rotary joints come out to extend, the elevator drops to match the height, you can do a perfect linear motion. But now you're servoing three different axes where they have unique set points every millisecond along the way, and they have to stay in sync. Otherwise, you're not going to do the linear motion correctly. You'll do some curved path. That's that's not easy. You know, It's much easier to have a prismatic joint, maybe even with a pneumatic cylinder that just goes in and out. Way easier, obviously. Um, and then the last one here is, you know, how sensitive are you to error on these degrees of freedom? So, you know, let's say you're using a servo joint to aim a shooter. You might need to reliably and repeatably aim to like a quarter degree. And maybe your robot only has three doffs, but if you're not a team that can nail that level of precision reliably, and this is a problem you saw, I think probably in 2013 a lot, where a lot of robots didn't have a lot of degrees of freedom, um, that can be really rough because now every time you're serving that motor and you're a little wrong, you're missing shots. Um, so you didn't have a lot of doff counts, but it was a very expensive feature to get right and get dialed in. Andrew, do we have any questions coming along as we're going, or should I just keep going and leave questions for the end? Um, yes, we have a question from Diego Sensky. Adam, how much do you have an FRC? Also, did you learn more about good robot design while you were a student or a mentor? Uh, would you mind dropping the question in the chat as well? Just the, the audio is not perfect. So I think the first question was, how many years have I been in FRC? Um, that's a complicated answer. I, I really was only dedicated as a student um, from my sophomore to senior year. Um, so that would have been the 2005 to 2007 season. I like visited and hung out and didn't contribute any value on the high school team uh, a little bit before that. So I don't really count that time too much. Um, and then after I graduated high school, I spent 12 years at, you know, in San Luis Obispo, California, mentoring 973. Um, the bulk of that time is lead mentor. And then I've moved up and now have, I guess, one and a half seasons because 2020 was canceled pretty early uh, with 2D4 and 2135. Uh, as for more, you know, where do they learn more? Um, definitely as a mentor. I only got into design my senior year on my high school team. Uh, we kind of had a mass exodus, exodus and there was a hole for me to fill. I did programming before then, but I, I also just wasn't a really dedicated student um, and didn't try that hard. We also weren't a team that was really in the know at the time. So I didn't have, you know, I had some great mentors that I learned a lot of life skills from, but not a lot of pertinent FRC skills. Um, it, it's cool now that I think the community is so much better and we have so much great workshops and content and off the shelf components that 
uh, some of the students that really dedicate themselves can can learn a, a great deal. Any other questions or should I keep rolling here? Uh, so far, we have no other questions from the audience. Okay. So this slide's a little similar but different from the last one. Um, and it's kind of changing it and talking about types of, of motion versus, uh, you know, the I guess last slide was types as well, but different types of types. Uh, rotary motion can be really easy to make, you know, so an arm or a wrist, because you just need a shaft. There's fairly good off-the-shelf setups to make that now, um, but it's a lot harder to control. You know, as I change the angle of an arm, I change both the X and Y value of the tip as well as the angle of the tip. Um, so if you're trying to get height out of an arm, you know, you have to deal with that. Maybe you have to add another joint, which adds more complexity. Um, maybe you have to live with your game piece sweeping through an angular change, but you know, that's kind of a bummer. Can be easier to make, harder to control. Linear, um, although there's some really good off-the-shelf kits now, generally harder to make an FRC, but very easy to control. I know that I'm only changing one degree at a time. You know, I'm just changing height or I'm just changing depth projection, and I don't have to worry about the other ones. Um, high force mechanisms, even though we've had a pretty good run the last half decade or so with high force games, are still really tough for teams. And, you know, that's just physics, obviously. Smaller force things are more forgiving, easier to make. Um, so climbs can be tough. Um, there, you know, there's a lot of great ones to copy now, but those can be tough. Um, 2014 and going back to 2010, a lot of teams had a high force mechanism where they pull back and then they had some method of letting go against a spring and that release of high force can be really tough and expensive. There are a fair amount of teams in, in 2014 that spent weeks getting that part right before they could even really get the rest of the robot working. It's also fairly dangerous if you want to sprinkle some safety in here. You know, whenever you're storing a lot of energy and then need to release that, um, that can be real tough to get right. People can get injured uh, and it costs you there. Um, to add some nuance to climbs and lifts, there's also um, you know different ways of holding up at the end of the match that can be more or less complex. So like teams discovered ratcheting end wrenches in the last decade or so i don't know so it's just a ratchet you can put on there and it will let you go one way but it won't let you go the other way that can make holding yourself up at the match really simple mechanically can make the control a little harder though because now i i have one shot to do this i can only run my order one way and if i miss the climb there's nothing i can do uh you can buy or make breaks you know west coast products has a break now you can buy mountain bike breaks and that's really nice because i just fire an pneumatic cylinder and you can pretty much trust that's going to happen at any point in travel and pull myself up but now that's more that i have to integrate and design and that sort of thing and even though they sell a break there is not like a perfect i put the break on the zersal planetary and i'm done and we can move on no there's there's some custom design you have to do uh, Continuous versus non-continuous is kind of the similar to the handoff, or it is the handoff pretty much actually. Um, on this 2D4 robot on the top right that you can't see that well, we were, or they were picking up Frisbees, and those Frisbees came through a intake and do like this bucket that then pneumatically went up, and then it was, uh, the Frisbee was pushed out into the flywheel um, pneumatically as well. So to cycle through that, um, to shoot four Frisbees, you had a bunch of different discrete actions you have to do. Um, and getting the timing of that was rough. I know they spent a lot to get that fast over the course of the season. They were really riding uh, the razor's edge of how fast they could go without jamming. Um, so, you know, obviously something where game pieces enter on one side and kind of just exit on the other and nothing ever has to change direction or change discrete states or that sort of thing is going to be a lot easier and simpler um, than that non-continuous setup. Um, I guess another way to view continuous versus non-continuous, actually, I just read my own bullet point wrong. Uh, is, you know, things like flywheels, conveyors, intakes, that sort of stuff um, are usually pretty simple. You know, they don't really change their footprint as they as they run. You know, they might be a little harder to prototype in some senses, but the robot doesn't change shape or size as you're running them, and that makes things a little easier. Um, to jump to the, back to the high force part, I really like this 469 robot here. Really hard to see right on the slide, but most teams, with few exceptions, had some sort of winched back catapult or punch your arm so they pulled back a high amount of spring force and then disengaged it and let it freewheel 469 had uh essentially a catapult arm i'll try to trace it with my mouse here although actually you can't see my mouse um they had a catapult arm that they just motored up and that got them about half of what they wanted and they then supplemented that with additional surgical tubing on this that when the catapult was stored 
the surgical tubing had a really low lever arm and it wasn't uh, causing it to fire. So they could safely sit there with energy loaded and as they ran the motors and went, those springs would come into play and add a lot of force. And, you know, looking at that, it's like, seems obvious and simple and why wouldn't you do it that way? But this is a, a design that far more teams could make than, you know, pulling back something high load and releasing it. Um, it was incredibly effective, but very few teams did this. Um, so if you can avoid winching high stuff under load, I would recommend you do so. Simplicity and tuning, this could be like a 10 hour presentation in itself. This is probably my favorite part of FRC. Um, this is the part I feel like I'm the best at, um, making decisions at the system level, understanding the process and play. Um, so what I mean by that is if you really wanna abstract the problem, the fantasy is I can show up to a regional or champs, I can take my robot that's in a million pieces, bolt it together, download code, not even turn it on, go play a match and everything works. I will always make my shots, my elevator will always come to the right height and score and that sort of thing. Obviously that's not practical for like 99% of robot architectures, but the closer you can get to that, the happier you're gonna be. Now the route to get there is really gonna depend on the skill set your team has, especially now that you know we have some really, really high level uh, roboticists and software engineers working with teams. Um, 973 never had a lot of firepower there, so we took a pretty simple approach. Um, but you, know, you just want to think about what do I need to do to get that robot ready to compete? Is it something I can just do in the pit? Like I raise the elevator to a certain height, measure with a tape measure, save that preset. Do you need a practice field or a representative goal? Like, do you need to actually set your robot nine feet back and do your shots? Because, you know, that's obviously a lot more expensive than anything you can do in your pit. You can't guarantee that you're going to be able to go to a practice field and, and do that. And then on the robot side, you have to consider how am I achieving the adjustment? Am I changing a number in code? Am I, you know, unbolting the pneumatic cylinder and bolting it to another hole so that now the range of motion is slightly different? Am I clicking in like spacers to shorten the stroke on a cylinder? Am I unbolting and moving a hard stop? Um, and there's pros and cons to each of those, you know. Certain teams hit a level where they can really trust that, that code is a great way to do things. And you saw a fair amount of turreted shooters with adjustable hoods for the brief 2020 season that I would not recommend to most teams. But for those teams, it was cheaper to do that and adjust in software than it was to do some sort of hard stop. Uh, for the bulk of teams, I would recommend you do your shooter adjustment with some sort of hard stop. Even if it is like a two position shooter with a pneumatic cylinder, you can click spacers in there. You can bolt on different holes such that, you know, once that's adjusted, it's not going to change and you don't have to rely on software to hold that angle. Um, kind of coupled with all this and this quantifies how painful it is, is how sensitive is your robot to adjustment, both in terms of like precision on the field and what components are affecting uh, your like what's in the tolerance loop on your robot side that's affecting your, your output angle. So, you know, it's terrifying. Um, if you have a very complicated camera routine that wasn't well architected, such that if you take your camera off and remount it, and now it's at like a quarter degree different, that causes your robot not to work. And we've definitely played with teams and interacted with teams that have that case. Um, you could also see this in the mechanical side, like for whatever reason, you got shooters that just, you put them back together and things, don't quite shoot the same and now you got to go retune you know hey 3000 rpm used to work now it doesn't work we need to go to the practice field and retune it that's a bummer you know obviously you want a shooter where i can kind of mess with it and poke at it and let it you know wear over the course of the season and not have to retune as much um two little case studies i'll, I'll sneak in real quick this 973 robot here um even though we do have a green light on that was just kind of fake people out which is kind of silly um we did all of our aiming with a flashlight that we bolted to it um, and a driver would just aim that flashlight at the goal, and then they would drive forward and back until the flashlight lined up with that line. Um, and then to extend that further, we had one preset saved. It was whatever RPM made our shots in auto. And so we, you know, we would do that auto tuning, see whatever RPM worked, and then we would just mechanically adjust that flashlight on a practice field or in the diagonal of the pit um, till physically the robot would be in the right spot for those balls to go in. Um, and that worked really well. We didn't have to rely on vision or any other crazy stuff. Um, it let us maintain a pretty high accuracy because we weren't introducing any errors on the vision side from a less than optimal vision setup. Um, for 
this slide could use more pictures and diagrams, but I'll, I'll speak to the case study here. So for 2019, 973 uh, had a, a vision loop for scoring these panels on the tower. Um, and it did a couple things. It you know drove us to the tower, it aimed us on the tower, and the farther away we were from the goal, the more it would actually aim us away from the goal such that as we got close, sorry, the, the farther we were physically away, the more we would turn away from the goal if we were off at an angle such that we would kind of force to be dri driven in an arc and approach the goal smoothly. Um, so we tried to get that all with continuous functions. Some teams did that by you know, using the limelight to figure out where they were in 3D space and generating a spline and driving that. So we took a much simpler approach and it worked really well at our first regional. We were really happy with it. There wasn't a lot to tune. It was a really simple routine. Um, and for whatever reason, at our second regional, it just was not working well for us. And we spent like four hours in the practice field trying to tune it in well. And, you know, we'd made kind of a classic mistake of, you know, sometimes if something's really easy to tune, you don't explore the boundaries and get good at retuning that in the moment. So, you know, coming out of our second regional and going to champs, we realized it was critically important to be ready to go to the practice field just once and retune the whole thing and be confident it was going to work. So... You know, we kind of abstracted this problem to, you know, no longer being a robot problem, but like the whole team is a system and we're competing with that system. So this checklist, if you zoom in and read it, it like doesn't actually make that much sense. It's all kind of shorthand. But the important thing is the, the three or four students that were involved in this and the one mentor that was involved in this knew what everything on here meant. They wrote down and rehearsed at home everything that was necessary down to like you can see grab tape measure grab battery grab ethernet cables grab the laptop that sort of stuff uh, they rehearsed everything and um that year at champs was actually about a month after i moved away from the area and up uh up to the the bay in california so i didn't see any of this happen and i was blown away when we got, got to champs and went to the practice field once and they ran through these tuning steps and tuned to all three parts of that pid loop um, and had all the stuff. And it's like they weren't even speaking to each other on the practice field in the moment. They went out there and just did it super quick. And the only reason they were able to do that was with this pre-planning and checklist, um, which is super sweet. And I guess the takeaway there is uh, if you are dependent on you know outside resources at a competition to get your stuff tuned in, make sure you're ready to use those quickly and it's not a, a cluster when you head over there. Um, I think this is the last slide in this section. Um, doesn't exactly fit with the previous conversations of robot architecture. It's kind of an orthogonal scalar, uh, but it's super critical. You know, there are a million different ways, whether using methods you steal from other team or using cost components for you to make the exact same robot faster. And if you make it faster, that means you can either make more robot and get done at the same time, or you can make the same robot and get it done sooner, spend more time practicing, programming, whatever. And you can go either way with that once you understand your team's resources, as long as you know you're really striving for that robot to be done week four. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on if you're focusing on these teams as kind of an inspirational target or someone you want to copy their working methods of, some of the most successful teams do not have the most approachable fabrication methods. You know, 2D4 and 118 are great examples here. Incredible teams, their resources clearly work for them, and they make some really cool stuff, and a lot of it is closer to what you might see in industry, but a lot of that is not something you should copy unless you are a team with their resources. Um, and there's, there's better teams to reference if you're trying to take a low resource approach. Um, to toot my own horn, I really like 973 is one to copy here. And then furthermore, I really like 1678. Um, they have their cat out there. Both of these teams have gone really far with essentially a rector set in the form of pre-drill tubing. And then almost everything else is a 2D plate, you know, some sort of plate with holes in it. Now, routers are really cheap these days. There's water jet sponsors. There's laser cutting sponsors. 2D plates are really, really cheap and fast to make, and you can iterate super quick. And if you look at 973 and 1678's CAD over the years, as long as you got a little bit of imagination, you can make some really complicated structures. You can pretty much solve every game challenge with 2D plate and tubing. With, with very few exceptions. 1678's gone a little farther than 973, um, and they've incorporated a fair amount of high quality 3D printing. I think they almost exclusively use Mark Forge. Maybe they use a little bit of nylon or something from Prusa printers. Um, and that's nice. That helps solve the hole a little bit sometimes when you want something to come off at an arbitrary angle, or you might want some big milled block, which isn't a 2D part. You can print that extent. Uh, but I would 
definitely look at those teams and then also look at the the vex application examples because what vex sells is pretty much that um to 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 get a fabrication method that's real quick and easy to copy um in general and this shouldn't shock anyone you know use cops where you can uh, you know really focus on the opportunity cost of your fabrication time your design time and you know the the money in your bank account as well um, even if you can make something a little better, you're probably better off using the COT solution. Um, the best teams in FRC go super heavy with COTs, um, and it's always interesting to see where that line is. You know, they're all using VEX gears, pulleys, any mark stuff, that sort of thing. Some use a lot of versus planetaries. Some make their own power transmission from those previous gears, pulleys, that sort of stuff. But they're not making stuff that would be better if they bought it, and you know, it should be the same for your team. Last point to stress here is I would standardize, and that's really on everything across the board. Standardize fasteners, so you have less to choose from. Standardize which subset of COTS parts you want to be working with so that you know decisions are easier to make. You, know, you can kind of architect your robot and say, we can use whatever we want as long as it's from this list of stuff. You know, it really makes it easier for students to move quickly with that design if there's a smaller set of things they can choose from, which seems a little counterintuitive, but I've seen it pay off year after year. Uh, standardize your fabrication methods, you know, like the, the 2D tube and plate is what I really stress, but there are other valid ways to do it. But whatever it is, I would standardize it so that you can rehearse over the years and practice in the off season with your specific methods. And students know, hey, I have this sketch on the whiteboard and I can already kind of picture how I make that in my usual method versus every time you make something, you're kind of going with a different fabrication approach. Cool, so that is the last slide. So I think we've got some catch-all questions at the end here to fill the end time. Uh, real quickly, we have a question Sam Mooby in the audience. Um, how do you stay on schedule even with adjustments or additional our team still misses? Um, the the short answer, which doesn't sound very descriptive, is you know, you need to make it your team culture to stay on schedule. Um, and that, that's rough and it sounds like a magic wand, but if you make it a focus over time and you reflect on where you missed in the past and why you missed and bring that to conversations about your resources and did you do too much, too little, that sort of thing, um, you'll get a better ability to hit it next time. There's not much you can do in any given season when you're about to miss the schedule other than de-scope. So, you know, long term, your team needs to practice on assessing previous years and making better decisions about what you're going to do kickoff day in terms of what you think you can pull off. Short term, the only answer is the disco. Like there, there is no magic wand. We've been working on this for three weeks and now in this next week, we're just going to solve all our problems super quick by working harder. Yeah, there's some truth to that, but that's pretty hard to do and you can't close the distance all that much. Um, there's a great panel this afternoon, with Mike Rossetto, Ty Holtzman, and geez, I'm forgetting the last guy. I'm sorry. Uh, and then myself. Um, about simplicity, and I think we'll talk about this kind of stuff there. So I'd recommend you you take a peek there. But D scope number one, can't stress it enough. Just do less on your robot. Axe whatever seems less valuable or least done. What is the most effective or important theme of simplicity? That's the next question. Uh, it's it's do less. There's a great GIF of geez, I forget the movie. It's the one where the guy goes to Hawaii. It's like forgetting Sarah Marshall, I think. And he's with the surf instructor and he's trying to stand up on a surfboard and the instructor just keeps yelling at them to do less. You're doing too much, do less. And it's like, that's it. You can apply that reasoning to just about anything. You know, the less you need to program, the less you need to practice, the less you need to make, the less you need to decide. All of that really pays off in terms of whatever is still in the bucket of what you're doing is going to be better. All right. Is it better to spend robot points tuning the robot or adding the new mechanism at a cost of tuning the robot? Um, that's situational. You know, you the, the more you reflect on things like this in the past and and get better about understanding your team's resources, the easier it'll be for you to make that decision in the moment. Um, but this this is really a classic trade off. <laughs> it's a great question. There are years where you're better off axing what you have and making something potentially more complicated in the moment that you have a much higher confidence of it working when it's done and it having less tuning required and there's years where it makes sense to um, just keep tuning and playing with what you got um, in the longer version of the same presentation that's linked way above i kind of talk about some of the decisions 973 made in 2017 that are similar to this so like we went to our first regional um, unfortunately didn't win um, 
And we, we still kind of had the shooter we've been running for five, six weeks at that point. And we are, we were already seeing some tech that a lot of teams were putting out and we were sure we could integrate some of that technology and make our shooter better. But we looked at where we were deficient in our regional matches. We looked at kind of the meta game of how many gears teams were averaging and that sort of thing and showed that we didn't really need to get better at shooting for our second regional for us to, to be successful there. We knew we would for champs, but we knew we wouldn't for the second regional. And then to drill down a little more, we actually had a fairly bad gear intake because originally, so we were grabbing with two wheels on the side and it would kind of come up and down like this. And we did that so that we could spin the gear in place and index the vertical V perfectly for the spring. And then we found that that just wasn't useful. So we had this gear intake done um, and it was a little suboptimal. And we knew going into our second regional that we wanted to get better gear intake or we wanted to be better at gears. Um, and it's like, what do we do here? Do we practice more with what we have or do we make a better gear claw? And we actually kind of kicked off both because we had enough bandwidth to do that. We made a better gear claw. And at the same time, we put a camera on the robot so that the drivers could see the gear on the camera um, and just practice picking up a little bit. And we found that that was enough. You know, that extra day or two of practice, which is kind of tuning, um, was better than putting on that better gear claw. And then to complete the analogy, we ripped off everyone's shooter technology we could um, coming out of regionals to champs, and our shooter was was pretty sweet. How do you simplify That's repairs? Sweet. Stuff. What was that? Uh, sorry, I was just this was an audience question. Uh, continue. Sure, go for it. Uh, this is a question from Timothy. How do you simplify repairs? Is going to break, so how do you make it easy to replace? That's a great question. So there's two halves to this. One, I think, is just the pure mechanical aspect of thinking what will the process be to replace this? Do I have to take off other systems? How many fasteners are involved? How long is it gonna take? Um, and, and just do what you can to make things simpler there. And there's no universal answer that's perfect. You know, I think you hear a lot of people talk about a fantasy of like, oh, I can replace this system with two bolts in 30 seconds. Um, you know, sometimes that's great and you can do that. Sometimes your system kind of has to bolt to a bunch of different things and you gotta replace multiple parts. Um, just do whatever you can to, to to make that easier and extend that through your drive practice. You know, uh, on 973, we wouldn't make the pit crew come to every single drive practice, but we made them come to a fair amount and they could like do their homework and stuff on the side. But when something broke, they would be the ones there to fix it. One, because they were better than the drivers at doing it. And two, because that was real pertinent experience. Um, and then sometimes we knew there were real pain points on the robot and we would do dry rounds with pit crew of stripping that system off and putting it back on. Um, and often you can save a lot of time just with slightly better technique. You realize, oh, I actually want a longer Allen wrench and I want to come from the other side or, hey, you know, the nuts usually on this side and the heads on this side, but actually we can swap that around and things go faster. You learn stuff that way. Um, the other part of this is more on the tuning side. And that's if you have something that you think might need to be replaced at an event and it's going to affect your shot or your presets or whatever, you damn well need a plan for how you're going to tune that in after you replace it. Because there's nothing worse than getting to a limb, you know, maybe winning that first match, losing the second match, this is the rubber match you got to win or, or you're done, and you break the thing in that match and you replace it and you're all stoked and you're rolling out to the field. And since your team's kind of new to this stuff and you haven't quite been there before, you realize as you put it on the field, like, it's not going to work. It's going to go to the wrong angle. We're going to miss our shots, whatever. Um, so you just need a plan for that. No universal, I, I guess the universal answer is planning. No, no universal answer otherwise. Cool, what's next? Um, do you have a good example of complexity gone too far? Also, do you have an example of simplicity too far? Ooh, complexity gone too far. Uh, there's a million examples, um, and I don't want to poke another team, so I'll think for a moment on 973. Uh, our initial 2015 robot was really dumb because we wanted to be able to put cans on top of existing stacks. Um, and it almost looked like the mobile half of 148 in 2015. And it made that robot way too complicated and we didn't show up ready and that sort of thing. And we de-scoped on that, totally stripped it down after the regional and went to the more traditional, just you have an elevator with can grabber and stuff on it. Before that, we had a elevator and a four bar and we didn't have a wrist. And it, and it technically worked. Like at home, we could build the full stacks, we could put cans on top, but because we spent so much extra time working on that, we didn't show up ready or tuned and we just played terrible. Um, other examples of complexity going too far, um, on 973 at least. Our 2012 robot worked pretty well, but not incredible. And it was 
most complicated robot I've ever been involved in. Swerve Jive, Turret, Just Angle, Shooter. A lot of that stuff was harder back then than it is now. Um, and I'm sure many people can think of, of teams that uh, make robots that are too complicated. As far as simplicity gone too far, I think that's really a red herring. There's very few teams that actually hit a point where their robot is too simple and, and their performance is poor because they were too simple. Um, I think it's easy to make a robot that maybe only cost 100 points to make um, and your team could have done 150, but then you still end up not fully tuning it in. Like that's most teams. Most teams don't go to every match and play perfectly um, and then say, oh, we would have been better if we made a more complicated robot that had more capability. We weren't scoring enough. We weren't doing enough. In reality, a lot of scoring is just based on practice and tuning and confidence in the robot and a picker that can keep it running. Um, so I think too simple is... And unless you're a top 25 team and you're losing Einstein because your auto wasn't as good, it just isn't really a thing. Uh, an audience question from Sam Masubi. Is it better to have a heavily rated robot or a robot that is very replaceable? Oh, man. Uh, like I've been saying the whole time, you know, all this stuff is a theme. There, there is no yes or no for all of these across the board. Um, it depends on how likely stuff is to break, how often you'll need to replace it, how likely it is you might want to change the design over the course of the season. You know, a heavily integrated robot that you get the design right the first time don't need a change over the course of the season and rarely breaks uh, once you're done is now like the simplest thing. And that's kind of a catch-22 here. Like 2BD4 in 2014, when they got that robot done, they were very different than every other team that year. And when it was done, it was super simple. Everyone was like, oh, we should have made that. That's the simplest thing. That's obvious. But to get there and show that that integrated design would work and then also have the confidence that over the course of the season, we're not going to need to appreciably change this and our stuff isn't going to break, that takes a lot of skill. And that that's really hard. Um, so I don't know. I don't want to give an answer to this one other than that rambling uh, uh, what theme the there. Or... Great question. I, I should have made sure I, I spelled out all the acronyms here. At work, we get grilled if we do acronyms without explanation. Uh, COT stands for common off the shelf or consumer off the shelf. I've heard that as well. I think uh, both are, are pretty commonly used. It just means you can buy it. You know, Vex Pro, Rev Robotics, Andy Mark, West Coast Products. Geez, I'm forgetting a couple other companies. They all have some or a complete ecosystem of FRC specific off the shelf parts that are just great. And if you're not using at least one or two of those vendors, um, you're going to have a rough time. And in reality, you probably should be cherry picking and going to all of them. So like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty biased towards Rev, sorry, towards Vex and West Coast products for the mechanical systems and the gears and that sort of thing. Um, but I go to Rev for a lot of their sensors. I think they've really done a better job than the other vendors in terms of like they have a really sweet magnetic limit switch. They have a pressure sensor. They had the photo sensor last year. Um, Andy Mark, I, for, I forget what we buy from Andy Mark now, other than the, the kid apart drive is incredible uh, and can't hype it enough. Um, as a follow-up, whether to have a custom part for your rose a better job or a COTS part that is not perfect but easily replaceable? Uh, I'll give two answers here. So one, if you're talking about a part, COTS is almost always the right option at the component level. Um, as you start getting into assemblies, um, or more like plates, I guess plates versus parts like a shaft, a gear, that sort of thing, um, custom is usually probably better. There's not a lot of off-the-shelf assemblies, but even this is gonna be dependent on your team's resources, you know? And, and it's all the gradient. Obviously, no team is making their own bolts. And if they are, it's probably done. Very few teams, but a handful are making their own gears. You, know, you probably shouldn't do that in FRC these days. There's a couple examples where it makes sense, especially as you're, you know, lasering or water jetting or printing like some big pulley gears or like a giant arm gear, fine. Um, but you probably could have done that with COT stuff. As you get into uh, more nebulous things like a whole intake or a custom drive rail, well, it's just going to depend on your team's resources. And that's why I, I want to really stress the earlier point of schedule drives decisions. Um, if you can get it done in time with the custom thing, and you're sure that the, the bandwidth for that custom part isn't robbing something else from being better, then custom might be the right answer. If you can't get it done in time or the, the resources are better spent for some other part of your robot, then COTS is the right answer. But once again, it's all a theme. 
and you just got to practice getting the awareness for where the sensitivity is. Um, is rotary motion other than like straight lines, such as an elevated swinging arm? As it you saying, is, is rotary harder than linear, just like generically? Is that the question? Yeah. Uh, yes, for design uh, purposes. Like with, uh, Once again, you know, everything's a theme. I, I think it's easier to make rotary axes quicker in FRC. It requires less components. They're easier to conceive of. Essentially, you need the side that doesn't move, and you need a shaft, you need some sort of bearings, and you have the stick, and you got stuff moving. And you seem to get one part right. Linear motion can be a lot tougher because you have bearings in different spots, whether those are plastic sliders or actual bearings. And there are some off-the-shelf kits to make that easier now. And I think that difference isn't as large as it used to be. But I, I would say generally rotary motion is easier to make. However, in terms of match control, depending on what you're trying to do with the thing, linear motion is often way easier to control. And that's back to that earlier point of linear motion is only changing one variable at a time. Rotary motion is changing three. So linear, I can just do in, out, or up, down. Rotary, if I want to use rotary to elevate something, I also have to change my horizontal projection and I'm changing my tip angle. And you can throw more rotary joints at it to take that out, um, but now you're just adding complexity. So, Cool. Well, I think we are at time for today then. Um, thanks for putting up with my rambling a little bit. Hopefully um, there's some great content in here. And I would encourage you to go back with your teams and start assessing you know, previous seasons in totality and also you know, individual decisions. And, and getting a feel for, for you know, where your team can improve in some of these areas to move faster or be simpler or more competitive, whatever it is you're trying to optimize for. Thanks for your time today, Andrew. It's been a pleasure, Adam.